This series of paintings was suggested by a brief article published many years ago in the magazine Outing, written evidently by an experienced cowman. They are reminiscent of my first trips to the Western Plains in the early 80s, when it was still a free grass country. There were a few scattered ranch houses, or rather range headquarters, with perhaps a corral or two nearby, but the range was open. The water holes were free for all, and the several trails that wound northward, the Chisholm Trail and others less famous, swung this way or that to reach water or a good crossing, but were not cut or diverted by lines of wire fence. The barbed wire had not come yet, nor the nester, nor the sheep. Much of my exceptional opportunity to sketch and study the West in the range life of those early days I owe to the brothers Frank and Romeo Houston. They were cousins, I believe, of General Sam Houston. Frank Houston was a beef cattle man and handled several hundred thousand head of cattle annually. His activities covered the state, but withal, he had ever an appreciative eye for the beauty and romance of it. Romy Houston, much younger, was a college man with a flair for natural science. He knew from observation, books, and Indian lore, the flowers and the animal life of the West, and he was the most skillful cowboy I ever knew. I like to think back to the days I spent with those two men. Driving the Herd The rocky hilltops are capped with shin oaks. Down on the creek, a few cottonwood and hackberries grow. Occasionally there is a feathery mesquite, but for the most part the miles and miles of rolling prairie are covered only with a sparse growth of brownish-gray bunch grass and golden-yellow curly mesquite. Often the pink soil shows through. On level stretches is a hint of mirage, and on the far horizon a butte is pale and blue against the sky. All of it shimmers and glows opalescent under the intense light of the midday sun. Along the side of a wide valley, Coulee, almost a canyon, dug deep from the prairie's surface by uncounted centuries of rare but torrential rains, winds the dusty, much-worn trail. Along it for half a mile before us extends a motley mass of varied color, red and yellow, black, brown, and white, like an inland, slowly moving flood with surface of bobbing horns and swaying shoulders and lashing tails. Among them everywhere rise tributary streams of hazy dust, merging about to form the great dust cloud that rolls northwestward. Along the edges of the herd ride at intervals the brown and sinewy cowboys, gay of shirt beneath their open vests and red and blue bandanas and dusty broad-brimmed hats. Often they dart forward on their nimble ponies, throwing back into the herd some restless steer that is broken from the heaving mass or driving away from the trail cattle native to the range. Far away at the head of the herd rides the boss, scanning with practiced eye the range ahead. At the rear with the remuda of extra mounts ride half a dozen men, keeping well apart, watching the wall of animals before them calling sharply now and then, whoopee tie ya yo to urge on the laggards and weaker steers and stragglers that would stop to graze. The air is heavy with the smell of dust and cattle. The silence of the mighty prairie is broken only by the dust-muffled tread of 10,000 hoofs, making an all-pervading whisper as of wind among leaves. Longhorns rattle as they swing together. There is a creak of saddle leather, while above and over all are the sharp and urgent calls of the cowboys driving the herd. Watering the Herd what a fountain of bliss is a watering place on the trail. Its waters ripple and sparkle in the sunlight with ever-passing breeze. Its little sandy beaches are bathing places for the birds, and in its shallows the sedges and water weeds, though torn and trampled by many hoofs, are yet the playground for a myriad of bright-winged, darting dragonflies. The water may be muddy, stained with the red of all the west, and hot with all the day's heat from the summer sun, but if only it is sweet and free from jip, it is well, and like nectar to a thirsty man, horse and cow alike. For a mile the cattle have been hastening, called by the moist enticing smell of it. Arriving at last at the water's edge, 
the leaders plunge eagerly in to be urged onward again and again till all the mighty herd is in the pool, knee-deep, belly-deep, or buried to their brown and tawny shoulders in the refreshing waters, their hoofs sunk in the cool sand and ooze of the bottom, they drink or stand with half-closed eyes, or move to drink and drink again, blissful, greatly content with relief from the hot and dusty trail. Early with the herd, the cowboys have ridden in, and while the ponies drink with muzzle thrust in halfway to their eyes, the equally thirsty men dip and drink from the brim of their Stetson hats. Now, in scattered groups around the pool, they lounge lazily in the saddle, or dismount to cool and rest themselves in tired horses resting but ever watchful, even mindful of duty to the herd. Up on the bank, a mesquite tree with lacy foliage throws a meager shade. A flock of crows, disturbed from their fishing, caw raucous protest as they fly away to a grove of cottonwoods up the stream. To the left, a low grass-covered hill or mesa cuts the horizon. In the far distance is a mountain, a blue cloud shadow at its base. Over all float the cumulus clouds of a perfect summer day. The trail with its long, hot, weary miles of hardship is forgotten. It is an hour of rest, peace, quiet, while watering the herd. Bedding the Herd It is the end of a long, hot day. Up from the canyon and beaten trail, on ground as level and smooth as may be, the tired cattle are brought to rest. Held loosely, they soon begin to lie down, singly and in little groups at first, then more and more until a few men can hold them while the others ride away to where a thin column of smoke marks the location of Cook, Chuck Wagon, and the Knight's Camp. Here are coffee, sow belly, and lick and a stack of hot bread mounts high to sink again as the hungry men come in. Nearby, the night horses are picketed, and the men, having eaten, get out their bedrolls, for their night's sleep will be broken by time on guard. Meantime, around the herd ride the men of the first guard, pushing in, perhaps, some straggling steer with soft persuasive curse, shaping the herd and making it compact, for men must ride around it all through the darkest night. The scene is one of peace and wondrous beauty. The sinking sun gilds alike the distant cloud and the present mighty herd with golden glory. The western sky is one vast opal, luminous with tints of pink and purple, gold and olive green, flung high around the nucleus of the departing sun. Soon the colors fade and the dusk is closing in. Grazing ceases and slowly and with contented grunts, the last of the herd are dropping to rest. A cow bawls plaintively. From across the herd comes the lulling croon of a cowboy's song. Now, in the dim light, a solitary bull remains standing. His broad head illumined a moment by the dying light of the west. The distant camp grows quiet. An owl hoots in the canyon and is answered by its mate. The great bull looks about him leisurely. Then he too sinks to rest. The herd is bedded. Guarding the Herd At midnight, the third guard are awakened, bring in their picketed horses, saddle, mount, and the sound of their tinkling spurs grows fainter and fainter as they ride off to the herd. Two of the men, Bill Stewart and Dan, are old and seasoned cowmen, bronzed of face and bowed of leg by years of saddle life. The other, Jack, is a younger man and only two years out on the plains, yet is already efficient and a general favorite, for he is trusty, genial, handsome, and has a beautiful tenor voice. Somewhere, like many another cowboy, he was raised in a cultured home. The wanderlust and the lure of the West seized him, and now he is here and rides out with the other men to the sleeping herd. It is a glorious night, the brilliant moon already past the zenith, as the feathery clouds drift across her face, alternately lights and dims again the peaceful scene. Far as the eye can see are huddled forms of sleeping cattle. Here and there a restless steer gets to his feet, stretches, stands a while, and lies down on the other side with a sigh of deep content. Down in the canyon the owl still hoots. Out on the prairie the coyotes call, 
high, keen staccato mingles with the deeper note of the great gray wolf. The moonlight, glimmering pale on many polished horns, becomes weird and ghostly in the shadow of a passing cloud. But always the never-ceasing watch goes on as back and forth around the sleeping pilgrims go the guard, themselves at times vague, shadowy forms, not moving silently but singing or humming as they go, that no nervous steer may be startled by an unheralded approach, but rather that the weary herd may be soothed and reassured as on and on the riders sing their lullabies. The cattle are in a strange country, far from their native range, and the now familiar presence of the men gives them a feeling of safety. The voices of Bill Stewart and of Dan are instinctively low and subdued, as from across the herd Jack's silvery tenor wafts beauty into the night as he sings, now perhaps a part of an aria from some opera heard of old, now a college song reminiscent of old chums and happy carefree days, and now a verse of a hymn learned years ago in church or Sunday school back home. Sometimes the mellow notes float as far as the distant camp, bringing to the heart of some listening cowboy wistful memories of other days. Two o'clock and all's well. The air of advancing night grows crisp and cool. Occasionally there is a stirring of the breeze. A little oftener, perhaps, the cloud shadows sweep across the plain, but the sleeping herd is quiet. Peace and rest are over all, and a great calmness augurs well as back and forth and around and round ride the crooning cowboys, guarding the herd. Stampede in the Canyon Half past two, and the boys are counting the minutes before calling the cocktail guard that relieves them when a passing cloud causes momentary darkness. A pony stumbled at a badger hole. A slicker becomes loosened, and just at that unfortunate moment, a sudden gust of wind whips it from the cowboy's hand to sail with eerie outspread wings straight at a nervously gazing cow brute. That imp of Satan whirls and bellowing with terror promptly charges straight for the very center of the herd. Every wild steer is instantly on his feet. The cowboy's warning shout is too late. The mischief is done. One shiver pulsates through the great huddled mass. Then they are tearing down the coulee as scared cattle only can fly toward the narrowing break that leads to the still narrower canyon below. Just in front of them are racing the three cowboys with slack rein and active heel. It is a life-and-death race, and the sharp spurs and riders' voices urge the tough little ponies to their utmost. If they can only keep the lead until the level plains at the mouth of the canyon are reached, the herd can be milled and the stampede stopped. They sweep through the break and into the canyon, where the rock walls tower 400 feet overhead. The trail is rocky underfoot. Pitfalls lie in wait to catch the ponies' flying feet, but the pace must not be slackened. The canyon awakens and roars and protests with all the power of its echoing lungs. The clashing horns and clattering hoofs answer with increased vigor. Woe and swift death are the lot of anything living that falls under this thundering mass. A steer stumbles. The next one crowds him down. And in shorter time than it takes him to fall, the breath is trampled from his body by a hundred hammering hoofs, while a thousand more pelt him into a shapeless mass of hair and blood. Only a half mile more, boys, and we're all right, shouts Bill Stewart. And even as he speaks, his pony trips, and horse and rider are buried under the sea of maddened beasts. As Jack, in a moment of sympathy, impulsively draws rein and slackens his pony, the foremost steer butts it to its knees, and they too are lost to sight. So the race goes on, on, on. The remaining guard, with hat off and coat thrown back, is still at the head of the herd with lips close drawn and the expectancy of swift death on his face. The keen night air is none too cool for his heated blood, and he welcomes the life it gives his pony. A short half mile, and as the canyon debouches into the falda and comparatively level ground, the cowboy swings his horse to one side and allows the leading steer to come abreast, when from his leveled pistol he sends a belching stream of fire scarce three inches in front of the wild eyes. With a sudden snort and spring, that animal swerves to one side. Quick as lightning, the pistol is there again, and the flashing fire compels him to make a wide circle. 
and finally turned back into the tail of the herd that is just emerging from the canyon. Close on his heels are the rest of the herd, crowding, bewildered, and confused, a wildly whirling maelstrom of milling cattle. Milling Cattle all through the gray morning watch, the one cowboy on weary, trembling horse rides just without the whirling circle of the frantic, milling herd. The mad pace grows slower at last, but it seems long hours before, through the frenzied bellowing and the roar and rattle of hoofs and horn, came the welcome shouts of other men. Then he can withdraw a little to one side and rest his drooping horse. The soft, sweet breath of dawn sweeps over the western plains. The prairie sparrow twitters sleepy to its mate. The sky grows eloquent of coming day. Long lances of light shoot up to the zenith, and presently the sun breaks through its veil of cloud and glints and glistens on the rocky crowns of the hills and tips with rosy light the mighty dust cloud that rises from the valley. The pace of the milling cattle grows ever slower until at last it is controlled. The milling ceases. The stampede is stopped. Up in the silent canyon, so lately filled with uproarious life, lie 73 dead cattle and two horses and cowboys crushed into unrecognizable shapes. A meadowlark sings. The sparrow's twitter becomes a hymn of ecstasy and praise. The cottonwood trembles and whispers in the morning breeze and breaks into glory in the morning sun. But they in the canyon have passed beyond its narrow limits to the grander heights and fairer plains across the Great Divide. The herd moves on. It is late forenoon. The plains glow with the light of midday sun. The air quivers with the growing heat. Far as the eye can see, the ground is covered with gray-brown sage grass, or the golden yellow of curly mesquite. In the distance, the herd, quieted again, moves on under its canopy of dust. The delayed chuck wagon is still in the rear. Further and to the left is a thin gray line of mesquites, and on the far horizon is a low blue range of hills. Back at the canyon, quiet settles over the plain. A meadowlark sings. Overhead, turkey buzzards are circling. A coyote slinks down from the brakes. Down in the canyon at the heads of new graves are two flat rocks and an uncertain letters rudely carved with a cowboy's knife. On one is Bill Stewart and on the other Jack. In the left foreground of the picture, a lone cowboy is riding to overtake the outfit. Yesterday's work is ended. Another day's work has begun as the herd moves on.